So this is a special episode of Ivy Acres Homestead. We're here at the end of the Oregon Trail Interpretive Center. I'm speaking with Bethany. Mm -hmm. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do here? Yeah, yeah. so I work at the end of the Oregon Trail Interpretive Center. Um, that means I get to dress like this every day and uh, lead people through our exhibits so they know more about the Oregon Trail and how people uh, got here in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. um, so I also work with school groups, um, Lots of fourth graders all at once, uh, which is exciting, and all sorts of different folks. Cool. You have people come from all over the world, or uh, yeah. mostly local, or? Yeah, a little bit of both. We, we still get local people that say they didn't realize we were open, uh, mm -hmm. so you're not the only one if that's what you were thinking. Um, but yeah, we definitely, yesterday we had some folks from Wales, and people come from all around. Because yeah. um, this is a very uniquely American thing that people from Europe are really fascinated by a lot. Yeah. I think it's the quintessential American experience. Yeah. I mean, you know, coming out here, get a fresh start, you know, mm. take control of your own destiny kind of a deal. Yeah. The American dream. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Right. Well, just a couple of weeks ago, mm. they were hosting the uh, 175th anniversary of the incorporation of Oregon City. Yeah. I came out here with a camera and got some good still pictures and some video, so I'll probably throw those in uh, periodically, some of those clips. Yeah. Yeah, Oregon City is the oldest city um, west of the Rockies to be incorporated. Um, so it was here even as early as like 1839, I want to say, that John McLaughlin, who was in charge of Fort Vancouver, sent some folks down here to build some buildings um, to take advantage of the Willamette Falls, mm -hmm. the second largest falls in the United States. So they were getting right on using that water power for mills and things like that. Mm -hmm. So when all the pioneers started rolling in, um, this was the place that made sense to set up all the land claim office where they could do that paperwork for that free land they were promised um, and all the other infrastructure. It was already a little bit set up here in Oregon City. So even when San Francisco was incorporating, they had to do that paperwork here. <laughs> they had to send that paperwork on a ship all the way up here um, to get that business done in Oregon City. All right. Mm -hmm. okay. it's, a, it's the first city on the, on the West Coast. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Definitely. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Let's take a tour of the end of the Oregon Trail Interpretive Center.
historically, how does the Oregon Trail compare with other migrations in the world? Yeah, because people have been, been moving around quite a bit yeah. in this uh, history. Um, but the Oregon Trail is actually one of the largest voluntary migrations in history. Um, so there wasn't um, necessarily, these were a lot of people choosing, volunteering um, to leave everything they knew behind and come west. So obviously there were some economic pressures, there was a depression, um, farmers were really struggling. Mm -hmm. There was a civil war about to kick off in the U.S. as well. Um, and a lot of health problems back east in those cities that were getting more and more crowded um, but not having sewer systems yet, so there were a lot of health issues over there. Um, so there were some of those pressures, but by and large, people, um, you have to be rich enough to afford the trip. That's a lot of uh, supplies you need for a six-month journey uh, through 2,000 miles of wilderness. So people were choosing to leave everything behind. Um, oftentimes, maybe it was just a, a younger son of a larger family that wasn't going to inherit anything. Um, or some people really did just come for the adventure of it. Um, James Fenimore Cooper's uh, novels were really popular at the time. He wrote The Last of the Mohicans and all those sorts of things. Um, so if you were working away in a factory in Pittsburgh or something, like some people that we know about, um, that reading a book like that could really be eye-opening and decide, you know what, I want to actually see Buffalo or the Rocky Mountains or the Pacific Ocean for people that didn't travel during for leisure in those days. It was so difficult. Um, to see any other part of the world than whatever place you've been born in, you had to do kind of something drastic like the Oregon Trail. So it was um, for 25 years, every spring people would, would start heading out um, big groups. So for 25 years, about half a million people moved west during those years. Um, 900 people the first year in 1843, but by 1850, like 60,000 people came in one single year. So it really took off. <laughs> How did they, how did they find out about, about mm. Oregon wanting to come here? Right, yeah, the, the reason they wanted to come all the way to Oregon and not just kind of steadily move west. Mm. Um, the Midwest was still seen as Indian territory, so not a real safe place um, to settle, especially, these are mostly people with families. Um, California was much more just men uh, because of the gold rush, so those were different kinds of folks leaving their families behind, a lot of younger um, single people. Um, but if you were on the Oregon Trail, that meant you were probably bringing your entire family um, because that was the way that was more cost effective to bring a whole family. You don't have to buy a, a ship um, passage on a mm -hmm. ship, ocean going ship going all the way around South America for every person in your family. Um, so you would come across the Oregon Trail and they were coming here. Um, it was advertised as being like the new garden of Eden and um, your Pumpkins will grow as large as your house, and the pigs are walking around pre-cooked with a knife and fork stuck in them, and you can take off a piece of ham whenever you want. Um, so that was the big draw for people, was that ham walking around. Um, and just the, the nugget of truth in that exaggeration was that um, the land is really good quality here. So mostly people were farmers. Um, they heard about it. Um, Lewis and Clark obviously came out and made a big deal in um, 1804. It took a while for their novel, their, uh, not novel, <laughs> it took a while for Lewis and Clark's um, book that they wrote about their expedition out here um, to kind of take off, for people to read it. Um, a lot of fur trappers were originally the only ones, uh, the only Western people <laughs> out here. Of course, they were Native Americans. Um, but those fur trappers were kind of out of jobs by the 1840s because the fashion trend had changed, so they weren't. Uh, selling as many beaver pelt hats, all the cool kids wanted silk hats. So those folks uh, were out of a job, went back east, and were able to say, I've been there, I've seen that land, I can actually guide you through. Um, and the Oregon Trail is made up of a lot of those fur trapping routes that they had learned from the Native Americans over here. So yeah, it was kind of a, a while, it took a while. Originally, when people started moving west, uh, some newspapers printed things like, it's practically homicide to try to bring your family out here. It's too dangerous. It's ridiculous. You know, nine out of ten people will die, I'm guessing. And this was the newspaper um, that eventually became famous for saying, go west, young man. So <laughs> that newspaper editor changed his mind. But when it first started out, it seemed kind of ridiculous. Um, it kind of took some um, of the missionaries that were moving out um, to open people's eyes about the fact that a woman could actually survive the journey. So because um, those uh, missionary wives were some of the first ladies that actually made the, the overland trip. So people had their doubts about it, but they eventually figured it out and a lot of people came here. 
Well, I know um, one of my favorite things about the uh, anniversary event mm -hmm. were the live history reenactors personified in the first person, mm -hmm. like they were just a part of the Oregon Trail, just mm -hmm. got over here on the Oregon Trail kind of thing. Yeah. Um, much more compelling than I would have thought, just, mm -hmm. you know, entertaining and, and uh, charming. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting that I think a lot of people think of history as names and dates and, and books and all that, um, but especially Oregon Trail history is just people, um, people that probably most of us have ancestors very similar to. Yeah. Um, and a lot of what we know about the Oregon Trail is from people's diaries, you know, so it's their, uh, I love one person complained in his diary about how hard it was to get his mules to listen to him. Um, so even just, we have this person's quote that says, the, the beast's how I hate him. He just had the nice summation mark or two. Um, so we know all their frustrations, um, and we know, you know, kids crossing the Oregon Trail and like trying to an adopt an antelope that they named oh, Jenny really? and all sorts of things. So even in those days, they were saying, Mommy, can we yeah, keep it? Yeah, they would keep it, yeah. yeah so. Same sort of, sort, sort of attitudes. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So especially when we get um, special visitors, um, guest speakers like those reenactors that we had at the 175th, they come out periodically um, and really are able to show people that, that these were just people. Um, they dress kind of cool, but um, but otherwise they were just people um, trying to make a life. Same reason people move today is is to have a better life for their family. Yeah. 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 Well, as you know, the preachers all were talking about some eternal promised land, but women, we know how those men folks started thinking about Oregon as being the promised land, and soon, well, Ian he had a bad case of what they called the Oregon fever. And I told them, well, we've set down roots here. This is where we said that we were going to grow old, and then he didn't play fair. He said, well, Nettie, there's your daughter, Jenny, with her grandbaby, or with her children, your grandbabies. You're not wanting them to grow up out of your sight now, do you? Well, what could this grandmother say? So, old as I am, I crossed the Oregon Trail. I'm sure you could tell just as many tales as I can about the trail. Well, we had our good times. I think my favorite times, that would have to be the evenings when we would all sit around the fire. Yes, this is never far from me in the journey. We all sit around the fire. Of course, the men folk, well, they were done with their work for the day. The women folk, our work never seemed to finish. I'd sit there sewing till most of the clothes were more patched than cloth. And then, then if I had extra time, I'd pull out the drop spindle. Yes, I had a wheel. Granny's wheel. The one she willed to me. Ian said it wouldn't fit in the wagon, and I had to give it to my sister. The one who never did spin. Well, I hope maybe she'll finally learn, but I brought the drop spindle along, so I'd be spinning wool. Now, Granny used to say, well, hey, well, Nettie dear, I've often thought of this, this is the Scots grandmother, right? Would see, I'd say it's the parable, parable of the wool. Because you see, when they're nay working together, they all fall apart. But as soon as you get them all combed in the same direction, and you put just the slightest bit of twist on it, they're strong. We learned that on the trail, now didn't we? We all worked together as I kept spinning. Now you might wonder, why was I spinning? Well. Maybe you learn coming along the trail that the happiest husbands are the ones with the happiest feet. And the happiest feet are the ones with the best socks on it. So if me spinning around the campfire could make Ian's feet a little bit happier and a little less grumbling, well, life was good. So has the uh, center done anything to focus attention on the Native American experience? Yeah, yeah. We. Um, I partner a lot with the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde. Um, so Grand Ronde is where all the Native Americans that were in this part of Oregon um, got relocated to once the pioneers were rolling in and getting all this free land. Um, so we have partnered with them a lot to be able to tear, tell that story as well as the pioneer story. Um, so they have an exhibit up in, um, in our buildings here. Um, we're also going to start off pretty soon with some um, craft lessons mm -hmm. um, from a tribal member um, with some 
cedar bark weaving and uh, making an elk hide possible bag and, and those sorts of things and those stories that go along with it of, of the traditions of how those things were historically used and all that. Um, and we're also working on, right now we've got a little film, feature film that takes quotes from pioneers and shows you what the journey was like. Um, but we're currently making a new film to accompany that that's from the Native American perspective. Uh, so I think that'll be coming out in June of 2020 is the plan. All right. Mm -hmm. Then you have, of course, the trail history um, as the end of the Oregon Trail, uh, which we talk a lot about. Um, I've always been fascinated with that, too, because working here in my whole life, Oregon City has constantly told this pioneer story. We've never really done a great job of telling the native story. And I think it's been the last few years that we're really starting to realize that we need to do it. And I think it wasn't that we didn't want to do it. There's this worry in how to do it, making sure that how do we tell that story in a way that's respectful? Uh, because the native story in Oregon City and most of the West is absolutely horrible. So here's Lamont Falls, Oregon City early on. Um, maybe a little um, not completely maybe accurate, a little <laughs> interpretation of, of, of how amazing Oregon City was. Um, but you can see you know even uh, nods to the native history in this. Um, Willamette Falls, of course, is a place that the natives came to and lived at for thousands of years. And um, that site near the falls where McLaughlin built his mill has been a very important piece of history for this entire state and the entire Northwest. So you had people living here by the thousands, even before the pioneers or the first settlers start coming in, before the Hudson Bay Company starts coming in. And, um, but it all kind of is happening around 1843 when um, McLaughlin is also seeing the, the Americans coming in and really saying, and as Dr. McLaughlin talked about earlier today, um, there was no way to stop them. There was no way to stop the Americans. And, and so you had the natives here, you had the Hudson Bay Company here trying to secure this land, and you had the American government giving out free land that wasn't theirs to give away. And uh, what about the women pioneers? Now, when they were uh, coming out here, um, did they have any more autonomy in their in their lives out here on the on the ragged edge of the frontier? Yeah, they would head back east. Definitely, because other parts of the world right now, it's still very much the Victorian era. So that is not a time we think of ladies having the most liberation. So. Um, Anytime you're kind of on the edges of society, you get to bend those rules a little bit more. Um, on the frontier, it was all hands on deck. So even if that's not a proper role for women or something, um, I know I've read uh, journals where most of the men had fallen ill or something like that in your group, which was very common, um, just with how common cholera was and other sorts of things like that. Um, so if all the men were, were down for the count for that day, um, this woman had to keep watch for the night. She had to grab her husband's musket and, or um, rifle and go out and keep watch in the middle of the night, which was not something she'd done before. Um, so they, they still tried very much to, to maintain the, the norms. They still did wear their full-length dresses on their 20-mile hikes every day. Yeah. Um, but in many ways, they were really stretching the bounds. Um, you know, Oregon uh, has uh, Bithynia Owens Adair, it was a woman that crossed the trail when she was very young, and she became the first doctor um, that was a female in Oregon. So all sorts of people um, getting to push the limits out here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, gentlemen's pants? My dears, my dears. Oh, you do need a great deal of assistance. Well, I am here to help you, and that is what we are going to do. Now, I want to give you some information um, about this. Now, of course, you can tell what they are, I would assume. And it was just a few years ago that ladies started wearing drawers. These are men's drawers, only they're made for ladies. 
And so the drawer, of course, this one doesn't help too much. Sir, you're just going to have to wait. I just want to know why it was torn. Uh, that's not torn, sir. Um, uh, now, moving on. Um, when, you, when you put this on, of course you know that it is for the purpose of convenience. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it's called, convenience. Now, the underhoop petticoat is is quite narrow, it's not big and full, but oh my, it saves you so much. So you don't get cold and drafty or wet. It helps protect when you're going through puddles. And pretty soon, I, I would assume most of you came over the trail. You may have come by boat, but over the trail, oh, the rain and the snow and the mess that we had to go through and the weight, it weighted down the dress and so pretty soon we were like walking like this. Okay. <coughs> See what it did to me? <coughs> if you were on a wagon train going from the east coast to the west coast, were you allowed a little latitude with the heat and the walking to wear less clothes? Uh, very often it, it wasn't that you were allowed, you just took it. You just did it. Um, having all of the clothes, my guess is that very often the corset came off. Right. Uh, that would be my guess because the women were sensible. They, they weren't, you know, having a, uh, a lot of times they would read uh, Goaty's lady's book or, or something and it would maybe uh, create some angst if they didn't do it exactly right. But most of the time, especially on the wagon train, I've read that they wore their chemise, they wear their drawers, and they don't worry, they have their petticoats and the other things, but they don't worry about them in the walking. Or the, oh, there is no way on the trail. In fact, if they got here with a petticoat, they were lucky. Because many times that petticoat was torn for bandages. And so women were told to bring a number of petticoats. Remember, uh, like the chemise, they needed to have at least seven. And, but that was essential because they did use those petticoats and, and chemises too if they had to tear off the bandages. That's the only bandages that they had were the women's petticoats. So by the time they got here folks, that was pretty sad for the women. Pretty sad. Well, why don't you tell us some of your favorite stories about right. the early homesteaders and uh, what they had to struggle with or, yeah. or uh, some, of their, some of their experiences. Right, yeah, homesteading um, for the pioneers was obviously a, very much a life or death kind of thing for them. Um, so oftentimes when you'd roll in, you'd been on the trail for six whole months, you'd probably eaten most of your food at that point, worn through holes through all your shoes and things like that. Um, I read one quote from a diary that said like, you know, today we made the last of our coffee and used the last of our edible things, so my oh my, there's going to be a lot of hungry people rolling into Oregon City and we don't have any money to buy things with either. Um, so it's, it's very much a story of people depending on each other, of, of the whole community realizing um, you know, for the public good, for the public safety, we all need to, to help each other out in the situation. Um, so the, the place that the Interpretive Center is located right now um, belonged to a man named George Abernathy and he had come out years before with the missionary movement um, and so he had this property already set up and he let people camp here because you would be exhausted and you need to just kind of rest <laughs> all winter. Um, not a great time to go out and build your house um, for the first place. So he'd let you rest here. Um, you would maybe have to go around door to door, you know, asking people, can we crash in your barn all winter or something like that. Um, so they, they were very much um, working together 
and looking out for each other. Um, and yeah, when it came time to, to actually get going and building your house, um, they would do that in the spring. So yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry, I was trying to think of how to connect those things <laughs> and the right. other stories. I would have to agree, and it's amazing. Yeah. It still exists as a community space here in Oregon mm -hmm. City. Yeah. In fact, at the end of the um, event mm -hmm. that they just recently had, um, they had this concert mm -hmm. followed by a big laser light extravaganza. Yeah. Um, I wonder what the pioneers 175, 175 years yeah. ago would have thought of that, you know, that, right. <laughs> that, that, that uh, demonstration. Right. You know, kind of amazing. But, what, 175 years from now, what are people going to be? That's what I always say when people say, oh, they had it so tough, how on earth did they do that? And like, people 175 years from now will say the same thing about us. <laughs> people are people, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, and there's some funny little, little anecdotes about when people first came, it'd be winter, so it was raining every single day <laughs> in the Pacific Northwest here. Yeah. So they had a little bit of adjusting to do um, there. So they'd be, diaries would be complaining about the rain and all that. Um, one man, um, they didn't have their house yet, so they spread out their sheets um, under a tree to get as much protection as they could, um, and he slept between the sheets under this tree that was dripping on them all night. Um, and so when he woke up, the sheets had been frozen. <laughs> so he was, uh, because again, but the story that they've been told back east is how great and, yeah. and temperate Oregon is and how wonderful it is, and they're arriving in winter. So his, his sister is sleeping somewhere else and starts yelling for her, Jane, Jane, come quick, like I'm in the land of eternal sunshine, frozen stiff as a board. So <laughs> she had to go get an axe handle to like crack it up and, and let him loose. So it's like a little bit of adjusting too. But come spring, people will be writing their journals. You know, it's March and there's wildflowers blooming. There's probably still five feet of snow in Wisconsin or wherever they had come from. Yeah. So they got, they got used to it. <laughs> Homesteaders, whether mm -hmm. it's modern day or way back then, mm -hmm. um, you have to work with the animals and the plants and, yeah. and uh, make everything uh, productive, you yeah. know, be pra practical solutions for things. Mm -hmm. What were some of the uh, items that the early homesteaders would have to uh, try and acquire as soon as they could once right. they were out here? Yeah. Um People would always bring seeds, seemed like one of the most important things that you could have brought with you because um, they're so small and lightweight, Absolutely. so very easy to pack. Um, the wagons can only bring like 2,000 pounds worth and once you get your six months worth of food, that's pretty much everything already. So seeds were something ladies would sew into the hems of their skirts mm -hmm. or you can make it the stuffing of your kid's rag doll and they'll carry it for you the whole way. Um, and then once you get here, that's your livelihood. So um, one woman, who ended up in Clatsop, um, she talked about having painstakingly gathered all these flax seeds. And so she planted them in the spring, um, had to you know, wait for them to grow, harvested them all very carefully, and then she was able to spin the fibers to be able to make her first pair of shoes in Oregon. Um, so okay. it was quite the painstaking process. You had to wait for a lot of things. Because the other thing, the stores in Oregon are not very well stocked. Other people wrote, you know, looks like there's only one bolt of fabric in all of Oregon, pretty much. And so it would be a big news item in the newspapers for like, a boat finally came in and we can finally, these are the things available in the stores now nice. that you've probably been waiting for for months. So um, oftentimes another trick they did for the pioneers was you bring just part of a tool, the most intricate, difficult to make yourself, and throw the rest away. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're bringing a shovel or something, you would throw out the handle and bring just the metal part. Um, and that's four or five pounds that you saved. Um, okay. You can make your own handle pretty easy later on. Or um, a spinning wheel. Um, it's kind of a big, yeah. strangely shaped item. So you'd bring just, this part was so important, it was called the mother of all. It's the intricate part with all the hooks and all that. Um, just that part, throw away the rest. And that woman with the seeds had to ask her neighbor just from description for him to build one for her. He'd never worked with a, a spinning okay. wheel, obviously. Okay. But she described one, and then he Frankensteined one together using chair legs or what other various pieces of wood they had around. Um, or, or even, they were so remote out here, they ran out of currency a couple times. So we had to make our own beaver coins, the mint and all that. 
um, and the apparatus to, to make the mint was from old wagon parts, Oh, actually. Right. So you just had to be very handy and know how to make stuff yourself, anything yeah. and everything. We're still doing that today. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Work with what you got. Yeah. Get something done. Mm -hmm. You have to, have to make things happen that way sometimes. Yeah. But it wasn't all super practical. I mean, the whole reason Portland is the rose city is the roses they brought out as well. So there'd be one little sentimental thing you could just to remember the house you left behind. Okay. Um, roses would survive the journey as well. So you didn't have to be a robot. You could <laughs> um, um, rem have your memories. Um, and even like with quilts, patchwork quilts and things like that would have been from old, you know, this is grandma's wedding dress or something like that that had been incorporated into this quilt or things like that. So. So it's a practical um, item, but it has a yeah. sentimental value. Of, yeah, you can yeah. still um, use those things to tell your story, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, just share something else with the, all the diaries that you've researched. Yeah. Um, let's see. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see. Another thing that was very important for the pioneers was the, the oxen. Um, when you're setting up your farm, um, as most people were going to be farmers, you have to, that means you have to clear the land, and plow it, and all that stuff. Um, so the oxen were so vital for the journey out here. Um, they are the strongest animal people could choose for the trip. You only needed four to pull the 2,000 pound wagon, but you would have needed twice as many mules. Plus those mules are grumpy and hard to work with. Um, whereas oxen, you don't even have to drive them. You can just tell them when to turn left and right and they obey verbal commands like that. Um, so yeah, and they're, they're much stronger and easier to work with. Um, and to take care of, horses are such picky eaters. You'd have to pack special oats for them. You don't have room for that. Um, whereas oxen will eat your laundry if you leave it in the wrong place. So they'll eat anything and everything. Um, and yeah, one man wrote in his diary that uh, those who come to this country will be in love with their oxen because they were just seen as so vital. Because then once you get your farm, you can use them to clear the land and yeah. plant everything. Yeah. Now, clearing the land, does that mean cutting down trees and dragging them away? or? Yeah, oftentimes. I mean, that was part of why the government was giving the free land was so that people would develop it somehow and make it more um, conducive to, to cities and populations and all that. So. That would have been the first task for a lot of people is just to clear the land, sell the timber, use the timber, whatever you were doing, mm -hmm. um, so then you could plant your crops. Yeah. Um, one really interesting man was named Henderson Llewellyn, and he brought two wagons filled with dirt that he planted dirt. trees in. Yes. <laughs> so, Seems like we have enough dirt out here. <laughs> right. It was a special <laughs> mixture of dirt that was supposed to retain moisture better. Um, so that it would try to keep his, you know, mini orchard saplings um, alive on the tr way out oh, here. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so... Well, that, that makes more sense to me. Right, like, not just... It's like, <laughs> it's like a raised bed on wheels. Yes, coming yeah, a rolling okay. planter box. Okay. Um, it did not make a lot of sense to a lot of other people, <laughs> so he got a lot of uh, comments. I bet, I bet. Um, He had to travel mostly by himself because he had to go so much slower than everyone else wanted to. Um, his daughter complained that the trees got watered before people did sometimes also. Um, but once he got out here, those trees were the only commercially recognized fruit trees here. Um, just crab apples and like organ grapes are the only native ones here. Um, so he brought apples and plums and cherries and all those sorts of things. And then he had an orchard already half grown by the time he arrived. So he said he got paid back quite a tidy sum for every insult he got on the yeah, way. Right. He, he balanced out. Right. Yeah, you know, one of the first things we did at our mm -hmm. place was plant a few fruit mm -hmm. trees. Um, so I can I can appreciate the, the sentiment of yeah. behind that. Yeah, and then once the gold rush started, he was able to start shipping things to California and sell like a dollar an apple, which is a oh, huge wow. killing. So yeah. yeah, I don't know what that what that would have been modern day. Oh, right. A lot more. <laughs> yeah, crazy, <laughs> crazy. And I was directed by the Crown, by, by Hudson's Bay Company, but it was a decision by the Crown, to direct all the people here into the Willamette Valley. Because we wanted, the, as I said, the Columbia River to be the boundary between the United States and Canada. And so I sent them to the Willamette Valley. Well, I did not want the Americans coming, and Hudson's Bay Company did not want the Americans coming. But they made a 2,000 mile journey, almost 2,000 mile journey. 
On that first two wagon trains, more than a hundred wagons were there. More than a thousand settlers that year came into Fort Vancouver in November. Now, they didn't have, have big wagons. They had these small farm wagons. They put canvas over the top, but there were small wagons. You can see here, it's not a huge wagon. And they gone over those 2,000 miles. They ran out of provisions, most of them did. They had no food. Well, the Hudson's Bay Company has a lot of agricultural land at Sepoy, it's forts and so forth. And so I loan, I say I loan them. I loan them grain. I loan them cattle to get herds started. I loan them some farm equipment and other things. The governor of the Hudson's Bay Company was livid. Me helping these American settlers that we didn't want coming here in the first place, I was helping them. They don't get a governor here for the territory until 1848. And part of that was the, the demands because of the Whitman Massacre to have the territorial government get out here and to deal with some of those uh, issues. But actually the governorship of of the uh, Oregon Territory, uh, President Polk uh, actually offered it to Abraham Lincoln. And his wife did not want to go through another frontier situation again, so she said no. Not so good for the territory, but probably pretty good for the United States. Yeah. All right, so we did a little research on our homestead, and our little piece of land was um, part of the original land grant for somebody named Andrew Hood, who uh, came across the Oregon Trail. And, you know, he was about my age when, when I moved to Oregon City, so I feel a little, little kinship with him. Uh, we're trying to make the land a little more productive for us and um, a little more homesteading kind of a, kind of a situation. Um, it's hard to, um, Hard to find specific information on people, mm -hmm. you know, research back then. But Andrew Hood was fairly prominent. Yeah. Um, I guess he was a justice of peace for a while. He, I think he ran a store in Oregon City for a little bit. Um, have, have you come across any any yeah. information about? Yeah. So I uh, saw that he came out and got his land claim in 1845. Mm -hmm. um, that's just two years after the Oregon Trail started getting major traffic on it. So um, he really would have had to wear a lot of hats, um, justice of the peace, farmer, store owner, all those sorts of things, um, just because he was one of the very first wave of uh, people to come out here. Um, so yeah, that's pretty pretty amazing. And, and he would have gotten 640 acres, yeah. which is probably a bit more than you have of yeah. it. Um, that's one whole square mile. That's how much uh, married couples got. Um, and that was partly to convince people to bring their whole family. You get a bonus if you have a wife with you too, you get more land. So um, that would have been pretty cool. And I, I did see too, um, the Bureau of Land Management has a website where you can still look up all those um, deeds, all those land grants. Um, so if you have a property and you wanna know who owned it before, or if you have an ancestor and you wanna know where their land grant was, you can still look all that up. Um, Andrew Hood had a piece of property you're describing up, up your way. Um, and I also saw his name on a couple of grants um, that said it was him and Dr. John McLaughlin okay. owning one property. So I don't know if they had some sort of business venture together of some sort, perhaps. Yeah. Maybe it was pretty common back then to be really relying on your neighbors and, yeah. and doing things to promote the, the growth of, of the town and everything. Yeah, especially when those cities were start, first starting to pop up. It's like, what? where will Main Street be, and, and hopefully we own it. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, different things people would, were going to need. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Because so, like, you know, they, really, they really need to hear about the um, Irma Tinger house. Really? Oh, God. <laughs>
building up sadness. We're all glad we made it through the Oregon Trail. And I hear there's going to be a dance with the young folk tonight. Yeah. <laughs> 175 years ago, Oregon City was the place to come to make a fresh start. And uh, three years ago, when we bought our our property and started our homestead, Oregon City is still a place to come for a fresh start. At least it has been for us. You know. What you do in life is really up to you. What is your Oregon Trail? I'm sure you can do it. You just have to take the first step.
little story about the guy with the, yeah. the fruit trees and the rolling yeah. raised bed. That's, that's awesome. Right? Yeah, the thing out of the box. <laughs> yeah, something I wouldn't have, wouldn't have thought of. Yeah, yeah. he's actually, uh, someone who worked on his orchard was from China, was named Ah Bing, and that's where Bing cherries are named after someone who worked on his orchard. So, um, a foreman or something. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. famous cherries. Yeah. <laughs> American Gothic, great idea. Okay. Shoot, that would be good.